All right, so this lesson is about addition polymers. Uh, we're going to, for the next two lessons, focus on polymers. And today we will focus strictly on addition polymers. So we're gonna talk about what polymers are, um, the different types of polymers, what polymer cross-linking is, and some applications such as plastics. So first of all, um, let's talk about silk, okay? Silk, um, you may have uh, seen this or used it in your life. Silk is a pretty popular uh, material to use in fabric. It has some really interesting properties. Each fiber of silk is extremely thin. It is thinner than a human hair. But if you have a similar size steel wire compared to a silk wire, Silk is not only stronger, but also lighter. Okay, so this unique combination of strength, lightweight, texture, and the appearance makes silk a really popular item, uh, especially throughout history. And it was the Chinese that first started cultivating silk. And the Western world, the Roman Empire, didn't really have that. So um, they traded with China for silk, hence the Silk Road. How do you get silk? Well, <coughs> you would have a silkworm. Uh, there's a picture of a silkworm on the left side. Uh, this caterpillar-like thing will eventually develop into a cocoon. And it will wrap itself with a ball of silk. So at this stage, you can harvest that silk and refine it at a factory and use that to produce um, the fabric that we know and love. If you don't touch the silkworm, it will eventually develop into a moth. So when the Chinese did this, they harvested the silk. What is left over would be just the bare cocoon. And they didn't really uh, let it go to waste. The bear cocoon is a delicacy in China, even today. And I, I was in China when I was a kid, and my family certainly uh, did buy silkworm cocoons from the supermarket. I still remember uh, there, was, there was a day where we went to the supermarket. You could see like people setting up shop. You would have somebody selling a basket of apples, Next to the guy will be another person selling, let's say, a basket of oranges. And then beside that person will be a person selling a basket of silkworm cocoons. And they're wiggling too, they're, they're moving. So my family bought some, uh, they stir fried that and just served it on a plate, kind of like in the picture there. I did not even touch that. I was kind of repulsed even as a kid. I mean, that just didn't feel right. But I know people even today that tells me that, hey, you should try this. It tastes delicious. It has this sweet taste when you bite into it. I'm like, no, thank you. I'm good. So why are we talking about silk? Because silk is an example of a polymer. All right? And the topic for today is just polymers. So what is a polymer? A polymer is just a long chain of repeating smaller subunits, okay? Kind of like a train where each section of the train will be a monomer connected together of the whole train as a polymer. So the word polymer comes from poly meaning many, mer meaning unit. And monomer is mono being one, mer being unit. All right, so polymer is a repeating subunit of smaller molecules. There are biological molecules like silk. Um, these are natural polymers. They're found in living organisms and we do not need to synthesize them in the lab. Whereas we can manufacture synthetic polymers. So these guys are not found in nature. We made them through our innovation. And they have a wide range of applications. So including rubber and plastic, which we will talk about uh, later in this class. So within polymers, there are two major branches of polymers. Okay, the first one will be homopolymer, and the prefix homo in English means the same. So a homopolymer would be a polymer made up of one type of monomer. 
And the example below would be ethene. Uh, we learned what ethene is, carbon, double bond, carbon. If you take ethene and you have like a whole bunch of them stretched out in a straight line, what you can do is you can just chain them together into polyethene. Okay, so that would be a simple homopolymer. And how you would chain them together is via addition reactions. And we learned in previous lessons, addition reaction involves the breaking of a double bond and adding together many reactants to form one large product. Okay, so in this case, you would have the ethene molecules, you break their double bonds, because you have two carbons double bonded to each other, if you break that double bond, each carbon would then be available to make another bond. And if you have a lot of ethenes lined up, the carbons will just naturally bond with the carbon next to it because they're all missing a bond, forming polyethene. So basically a saturated carbon chain. Okay. And polyethene is also known as polyethylene. It is the same thing. A polyethylene is the more you know, official chemistry name. Polyethylene is the more common name that we use in everyday life. And I'll tell you what they are a little later. The other type of polymer will be copolymer. Co in English means you know, to cooperate together. Copolymer is exactly what you think it is. A polymer made up of two or more different types of monomers, okay? Whereas homo is just one type of monomer, co, you have many different monomers. And here is silk. So silk is a copolymer composed of amino acids. Okay, if you recall your lessons in biology, amino acids are the monomers or the building blocks of protein. And there are many different kinds of amino acids. And in this case, one subunit of silk will be glycine, serine, glycine, alanine, glycine, alanine. All of these amino acids bonded to each other via amide linkages or peptide bonds. And if you take this six uh, amino acid subunit, you just repeat them over and over and over again, you will get silk. You have a long chain of amino acid, that's silk. Okay, so silk is a natural polymer of amino acid, which means silk is actually a protein. So um, we're not gonna focus on um, natural polymers in this class. It's gonna be synthetic addition polymers, okay? Within polymers, um, there are two types of polymers still. There's addition polymer, and there is condensation polymer. And the name comes from how they are assembled together. So we're going to focus on addition polymers for now. Addition polymers, as the name suggests, you add up all of the subunits with addition reactions, where you break double bonds and you simply link them together. You don't have any other product. You just have one long chain as a result. So for example, in the pictures here, I show two examples of addition polymers where you break the double bonds, you simply link up the carbons, and that's it, okay? And I'll show you in detail what these polymers actually are and some of their properties. First thing, the most common thing uh, that we use polymers for is plastic. So plastic bags are made up of polymers of polyethene. You take ethene molecule, carbon double bond carbon, you polymerize them into a long chain and there you have it, that's plastic, okay? Plastic has very uh, useful properties that enable them to be used in a wide array of circumstances. For example, um, it doesn't really react easily, it doesn't break down easily, and it doesn't break, and it's quite cheap, okay, and it's quite light. So many useful properties uh, polyethene will have. So just know that plastic is just a long chain of carbon, and well, why is it three-dimensional? You can stack up those chains so that you can make a surface, like the surface of a bag. Okay, so just know that this is made up of basically hydrocarbons. 
it's a big molecule of alkane. You may have this at home. Um, most households should have at least one of these nonstick frying pans. If you just have a regular frying pan that is not nonstick, you're going to have a hard time scrambling eggs. I, I like to um, fry my eggs. Um, my favorite type is sunny side up. So I take my nonstick frying pan, I crack an egg, and then I would just put it on low heat and heat up the egg on one side. And when I want to serve the egg, I take a spatula, <clears throat> I try to go underneath the egg, I try to scoop it up. And because I have a nonstick frying pan, that's very easy to do. I scoop it up. We have a nice sunny side up fried egg. If you don't have a nonstick frying pan, and you may have experience with this, you're going to have a hard time. You do the same thing. You crack an egg, you put it on low heat, and then eventually you think you're ready. Well, time to scoop it up. Uh-oh, it got stuck to the bottom of the pan. So if you try to scrape it, you ruin your egg. And you will have little bits and pieces everywhere. And you don't actually have sunny side up, you have scrambled eggs. And it's a terrible scrambled egg because it's not evenly cooked on all sides. And then you have to wash your frying pan, you have to scrape that, you know, all those debris off. It's just a terrible experience. So that's why nonstick frying pan is a thing. Why is it nonstick though? What property makes a nonstick? Well, nonstick frying pans, they're coated with a layer of tetrafluoroethene form in a polymer called Teflon. Okay, Teflon is the commercial name. Um, there's a license to use that name and you know that's why I have a copyright. The chemical name of that compound is polytetrafluoroethene. Poly meaning many, tetra means four. Well, you know what tetrafluoroethene is. That's just the IUPAC name for ethene with a bunch of fluorines. Um, in the picture, I show you the structure. Tetrafluoroethene, it is an ethene molecule with all of the hydrogen substitute for fluorines. They will add up the addition reactions. You break the double bonds between the carbon and you link up the carbon. Unreactive, non-flammable. Okay, why? Why is that inert? It turns out that the carbon fluorine bonds are extremely stable. Okay, this is due to the high electronegativity of fluorine atoms. And we learned electronegativity. Fluorine is the most electronegative element on the So it takes a lot of energy to disrupt that bond, okay? and a, a fried egg won't be able to do it. As a result, the CF bond, which is Teflon, is unreactive. It's not going to stick to anything because the fluorines will not let go of the carbon. So you can basically cook anything on that pan. It's not going to stick at all. Okay, so that makes sense? All right, so let's move on to uh, more examples. Propane, a three carbon molecule with a double bond, you can polymerize that as well into polypropene. And the common name for that is polypropylene. The picture on the bottom uh, tells you what that looks like. If you just look at the drawing, notice the weird way that this is drawn. I've taught you how to draw like skeleton structures of organic molecules. You go in a, sorry, in a zigzag. Right? We do a zigzag because it's a tetrahedral. It is not 90 degrees, but in this drawing, they're all 90 degrees. We're not trying to go for the accuracy of the representation here. We're trying to go for convenience, how to best view this. And the best way to think about polypropene is just a bunch of ethenes with a methyl group. Okay, we, when we name this, obviously it's not an ethene with the methyl group that is a propene. You've got to count with the longest chain. But you know, just first, I consider that it's to be a two carbon molecule with a double bond, but one of the carbons has a CH3 attached to a methyl. 
So if you just look at it that way, then you break up all the double bonds. You would link up all the carbons in a single bond such that every other carbon will have a methyl group. Okay, that is polypropene or polypropylene. And we use this in ropes. Um, you can have this in carpets. Some shoes are made of a polypropene. And these are supposed to be very strong and stable. All right, and if you watch movies where you know people try to climb a rope up like a cliff or something, that rope is made of straw. And as you climb, the rope starts to break apart and then you die. These are a lot stronger than just a regular straw rope. So that's why a lot of climbing ropes use polypropene, okay? This, again, you may have heard of PVC pipes. PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride. This too is a polymer of a hydrocarbon. So you have ethene again, and except this time you have one substitution for a chlorine molecule. Whoops. And then you would just polymerize them. You break up the double bonds. You will link up all the carbons such that when you finally make the saturated polyvinyl chloride, every other carbon would have a chloro group. Okay, and this also gives it a very stable structure. It is so stable that we build pipes with it and then we use it in construction. Okay, um, you can pick this up easily at Canadian Tire. Uh, you can just get a really long tube. All right, this one is an unfortunate um, application. Don't get me wrong, this is very convenient. All right? This made our lives a lot easier when it was first invented and a lot of people still use it today. These are styrofoam cups, styrofoam plates, uh, boxes, whatever, anything styrofoam. When you have an ethene molecule, C double bond C, and one of the hydrogen is replaced with a benzene, you have ethyl benzene in the picture on the bottom left. Uh, we call them styrene. If you add them all up, you get polystyrene. Okay, and you just have, again, a saturated carbon chain, but every other carbon, instead of a hydrogen, you have a benzene ring. And you can stack all of this together, you get styrofoam, polystyrene. These have, again, stable properties. They're heat resistant. You're not gonna break them up easily. And that's why we put hot beverages, hot food, typically used as food containers. The problem though, it is used because of its stability. It doesn't break down, so, and it's light. It's disposable. You use it once, it's gone. Okay, you're not gonna reuse this cup. If you're gonna reuse the cup, you just get a porcelain cup or a glass cup. Why would you use um, something like that? So this is cheap to produce. You use it once, you throw it out. Problem is, when you throw it out, because it is so stable, it will not degrade in the landfill. So it's gonna be stuck there for literal thousands of years. And this quickly accumulates in the environment because we produce a lot of this. It's a one-time use and you chuck it out. That's gonna quickly go up in numbers in the environment. So I highly recommend that you not use any products with uh, polystyrene. If you want to buy one-time use disposable cups get the paper one. You can go to Costco, you can go to Walmart, just pick up some one-time use disposable cups made of paper. And paper does degrade. Um, you, even if you throw that in a landfill, it will eventually break down and the contents will be metabolized and it will be used for something else in nature. But this one, no, it will stay there in the cup for thousands and thousands of years, polluting the environment, doing nothing useful. So please, don't use these cups if you can help it. All right, so let's actually look at some chemistry examples. In this question, it says, draw a structural diagram of a three repeating units of the addition polymer 2 z butene 2 ene okay? We know how to draw 2 z butene 2 ene because we had a lesson on that. This time, we have to draw them in the context of polymers. So please draw three 
2z butene. And then in step two, polymerize them, break up the double bonds and link them all together. Okay, I know I've taught you how to draw these with the skeleton structure, um, you're welcome to use that. And then I'll show you what I did. Okay, it's similar, but I used a more pretty method of drawing, which is not as accurate because it doesn't display the proper bond angles, but we're going for convenience here. So I'll give you like a minute or two, and then I'll take this up shortly. All right, so to draw the monomers, um, I have this. You notice the way that I'm drawing these. I know I've taught you to draw them in zigzags. Um, it's two Z, so the, uh, the high priority branches have to be on the same side, so they have to both uh, point in the same direction. In this case, I chose down. And uh, notice I use 90 degree angles. And again, I'm telling you that it's not actually 90 degrees. The reason I'm doing this is for convenience. And you'll see exactly why I did that when I polymerized them. So all you have to do is break the double bonds and just hook up all of the carbons together. Okay, I like to think of this as an ethene with two carbons on the parent chain with two methyl groups. Okay, I know when we name this, obviously you don't do that. You count the longest chain, that's the butene. But let's for a second consider this to be ethene with two methyl groups if you think of it that way, it's very simple. You just connect all of the carbons in the parent, the ethene, into one long chain. So there's six carbons in the three ethenes. So you have six carbons connected in a chain. And all of those carbons have a methyl group. Does that make sense? And that will be your polymer for three repeating units of 2 z butene. Does that make sense? So instead of using normal skeleton structure, which you can, you can still draw this with normal skeleton. I just find this to be a neater way of doing this. Um, it, it shows you the bonds in the polymers very clearly. Wait, how is um, the top one butene? Oh, how is the top one butene? Yeah, don't you need like four carbons? Well, yeah, it has four carbons, right? So butene has four carbons. Butene means four. You do want to think? Kind of. Kind of. Like, let me just label the carbons for you. That's carbon one. That's two. That would be three. And there's carbon four. And normally, okay. you count those four carbons. Oh, that's butene. Double bond and carbon two, so butene. You see what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm saying is don't look at it as a butene, look at it as ethene with two methyls. You're kind of cheating in that way, but you know, the carbons check out. Just connect all of the quote unquote ethenes together, such that you know, they're in a straight line, saturated with hydrogen, and every carbon has a methyl group. It doesn't really matter which direction the methyl group pointed at because they're single bonds. Once they break that double bond, there's no more EZ. You can just rotate them up and down. It doesn't matter. It just that this one is neater. Okay, so that's why I have the structure like that. All right, so example two, it says draw and name a structural diagram of the monomer of the polymer PVA used in hairsprays and styling gels. You don't need to know what PVA is. It will give you the structure. This is PVA. This is quite a confusing question. You have to draw and name the monomer of PVA. So this is a polymer. Can you do the opposite? Given a polymer, find the monomer. So does anyone see a, re a repetitive pattern here? What is the pattern? Remember, a polymer always has some kind of repetition. Right, and to find the monomer, you need to find the repetition. The hydroxyl and the hydrogen. Exactly. Okay. You repeat hydroxyl, hydrogen, hydroxyl, hydrogen. So that means one subunit of this would be one hydroxyl followed by a hydrogen. That would be one monomer. You see what I'm saying? And this would just repeat on and on and on until you get a long chain. Okay, so how do you draw the monomer? You have to break it up. Okay, a monomer is a separate entity. 
So that means you gotta break it and draw a double bond in between the carbon because we are learning about addition polymers. So the monomers must have been double bonds broken so that it's now connected. Okay, so monomer would be carbon double bond carbon with a hydroxyl group on one of the carbons. Does that make sense? And you would name this as you would name a double bond alcohol. Two carbon is ethene. You don't need to tell me that the double bond is on carbon one. Obviously, it has to be. And if you have one alcohol group, that's got to be carbon one. So just ethenol. That's it. You don't need any numbers because it has to be carbon one. Okay, does this question make sense to you? The trick is to find a repeating pattern. I like to circle that for clarity, and then that is your monomer. The next step is thus break up the bond so that you have a double bond. Once you chop the molecule off, the carbon must have another bond. So it makes another bond with the adjacent carbon, forming a double bond. All right, so that's how you would do questions like this. Given a polymer, find the monomer. Okay, so you will have to do something similar. Okay, so this brings us to cross-linking. You can have polymers in a long chain, right? However, if that long chain has a specific functional group, then there could be interactions between two long chains, and that's called cross-linking. And if you cross-link multiple polymer chains together to form a network, this will become more stable and rigid. Instead of being just a straight line, you have now a web. Okay, and if you look at that paperclip example on the right side, that's an example of cross-link. Individual paper clips are weak, but if you cross-link a lot of them together, you literally make a web. You can just go and catch something with that web. So the more cross-links there are, the more rigid and inflexible and tougher your polymer will be. Okay, so cross-linking will increase the rigidity and strength of your polymer. How would you cross-link? Well, if you need to do a cross-link, you need a diene. That means two double bonds. One double bond for each chain, okay? And in this case, you have one four diethenyl benzene. You have two ethenes attached to a benzene on opposite sides in red. And the two double bonds will be part of two separate chains. And if you look at the picture in the middle, you will have a cross bridge. The benzene acts like a bridge that connects two separate polymers together. And you will have millions and millions of this all with a little bridge once um, every other carbon. This forms an extremely strong structure. Right, and plastics can have okay, in the process of vulcanization, uh, meaning uh, treat it with heat, and also you have sulfur, sulfur crosslinks. Okay, Vulcan comes from the Greek word, uh, well, Vulcan, uh, meaning fire, hence volcano. If you have sulfur, sulfur crosslinks, that means you are vulcanized. This makes it extremely strong. So this is basically what rubber is made of. Rubber is a type of plastic it is different uh, from conventional plastic because it has sulfur sulfur bridges. Okay, the different chains are connected together with sulfur atoms. And this cross linking of sulfur makes rubber tough. That's why we use it for car tires. 
it, it's, it's able to withstand heat and friction. Okay, when you drive a car, you don't want friction to wear and tear your wheels, which okay, eventually does, but because of the high resistance, you don't have to change your wheels uh, very often because of polymer cross-linking. You can't have a plastic wheel. That's, that will wear and tear really fast. All right, so this brings us to more properties of plastic. As you know, if you heat up plastic, it will change shape, okay? So plastic is a substance that can be molded. If you apply heat or pressure, you will change shape. And then if you remove that stress, you will cool it down again, it will retain its new shape. If you take a plastic bottle, you uh, light it on fire, um, it, you will see visibly that the bottle will kind of start to wilt and it will bend. And if you cool it, it's gonna stay that way. If you don't actually try that, that's quite dangerous, but um, I will demonstrate this in the lab if I, must, if I can, but you no, know, well. So plastics are used for containers mostly because of its inertness. <clears throat> The containers are supposed to contain all kinds of substances. And if your container is reactive, that's bad because you're going to be reacting with what you're trying to hold. But plastics don't really react. So we can put food in there. Now, the food won't be contaminated by the plastic. You can put chemicals in there and you, you won't worry that the chemicals will eat up the plastic, which is why plastic is a good thing to use to contain acids as well as other corrosive material. And if you actually knock it over, it's not going to break like glass, okay? So that is a quite a good invention. And also it's very light. You can have a metal bottle, sure, and you knock it over, it's not gonna break, but that's heavy. And metals are expensive and metals get hot and metal, you can't really hold acid because acid will eat through metal. So plastics are a wonderful invention. They are unreactive because they're just large alkane molecules. They have carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bond, and they're all single bonds. So there's nothing really you can do to break those bonds under normal conditions. So that's why plastics are very useful to us. You can change the softness and hardness of plastic by adding crosslinks, okay? If you heat up the plastic, the molecules will vibrate. Okay, we learned in grade 11, temperature is just a measurement of average kinetic energy. High temperature means the molecules vibrate more quickly. And if you raise the temperature, the molecule in the plastic will start to vibrate. And if you vibrate, you disrupt the intermolecular force between the different chains. And the intermolecular force would be London forces, because they're all nonpolar carbon chains. But if they vibrate, that weakens the London force so that they're now able to slide past each other, thereby you can change the shape with heat. But the moment you cool it down, they stop vibrating. Well, they don't vibrate that quickly, they don't really stop altogether. So the London forces become stronger and they will get stuck in their new shape. Okay, so this will be a thermal plastic. Thermal plastic refers to the plastic that can be heated, molded, and get a new shape, like Lego pieces, for example. If you can melt a Lego piece, you have like a puddle of plastic. When you cool it down, well, there you have it. You have a puddle, a solid puddle. You can have another type of plastic. Figure B shows you the second type of plastic. Um, in purple, you have the cross-links. Different chains are cross-linked together. So that becomes a lot more rigid and stable even if you heat it, they start to vibrate. Well, the London forces are disrupted, but they're held together by covalent bonds as well. And a little heat is not going to break that covalent bond. So these are heat resistant. These are what we call thermal set plastics. So silicone, um, you have plastic spatula. Those are actually uh, cross-linked polymers of hydrocarbons. They will not melt under the heat. Imagine I use a plastic spatula and you try to cook and then halfway through the cooking, hey, where's my spatula? Because half of it is melted into the food. That would be terrible. All right, so that's why we use this type of thermal set plastic for things that typically need to take a lot of heat. All right, so you please know the difference. 
between a thermal plastic and a thermal set plastic. All right, so I have a copyrighted video, which I cannot show, um, but I will pause the video so that it doesn't pop up on YouTube. So this concludes our lesson on addition polymers, okay? So there's homopolymers, there's copolymers, and we learned that addition polymers are basically polymers added together through addition reactions, where you break a double bond, you make a link. Okay, and there's cross-linking. The more cross-links you have, the stronger the plastic. So any questions? All right, awesome. I'm gonna pause right here.